Welcome to the Solar Decathlon Building Science Education Series. I'm Paul Tursellini, and in this episode, we'll be moving on to part two of our insulation lesson. Part one covered the various insulation materials used in the buildings industry. Well, this episode will discuss how those materials are applied. If you haven't watched part one yet, I'd recommend starting there before moving on to this episode. When insulating a building, you can choose from many types of insulation. To choose the best insulation, you'll need to know where you want to install it and what R value you want to achieve. Other considerations may include indoor air quality impacts, life cycle costs, recycled content, embodied environmental impacts, and the ease of installation. First, let's look at blanket insulation, the most common and widely available type of insulation. It comes in the form of bats or rolls, and it consists of flexible fibers, most commonly fiberglass. In addition to fiberglass, you'll also find bats and rolls made out of mineral wool, plastic fiber, and natural fibers such as cotton and sheep's wool. Bats and rolls are available in widths suited to standard spacing of wall studs, attic trusses or rafters, and floor joists. These products are all available with or without facings. Bats are designed for 2x4 and 2x6 walls with different R values depending on the product density. This type of insulation can achieve higher R values in thicker spaces. On the screen, you can see more information and some example photos of this type of insulation. Foam boards, rigid panels of insulation, can be used to insulate almost any part of a building from the roof down to the foundation. They are very effective in exterior wall sheathing, interior sheathing for basement walls, and special applications such as attic hatches. They provide good thermal resistance, up to two times greater than most other insulating materials of the same thickness, and reduce heat conduction through structural elements like wood and steel studs. The most common types of materials in making foam boards include polystyrene, polyisocyanurate, and polyurethane. Loose fill insulation consists of small particles of fiber, foam, or other materials. These small particles form an insulation material that can conform to any space without disturbing structures or finishes. This ability to conform makes loose fill insulation well suited for retrofits and locations where it would be difficult to install other types of insulation. The most common types of insulation used for loose fill insulation include cellulose, fiberglass, and mineral wool. As we discussed in our insulation materials episode, all of these materials can be produced using recycled waste materials. The table here compares these three materials. Loose fill insulation can be installed either in enclosed cavities such as walls or unenclosed spaces such as attics. Cellulose, fiberglass, and rock wool are typically blown in by experienced installers skilled at achieving the correct density and R values. Polystyrene beads are typically poured. For loose fill insulation, each manufacturer must determine the R value of its product at settled densities and create coverage chart showing the minimum settled thickness, minimum weight per square foot, and coverage area per bag for the various total R values. This is because as the installed thickness of the loose fill insulation increases, its settled density also increases due to compression of the insulation under its own weight. Thus, the R value of loose fill insulation does not change proportionately with thickness. Liquid foam insulation materials such as polyisocyanurate or polyurethane can be sprayed, foamed and placed, injected, or poured. Foam in place insulation can be blown into walls or attic surfaces or under floors to insulate and reduce air leakage. Some insulations can yield a higher R value than traditional bat insulation for the same thickness. 
and can even fill the smallest cavities, creating an effective air barrier. Liquid foam insulation combined with a foaming agent can be applied using small spray containers or in larger quantities as a pressure sprayed foamed in place product. Both types expand and harden as the mixture cures. They also conform to the shape of the cavity, filling and sealing it thoroughly. Unlike most common insulation systems, which resist conductive and sometimes convective heat flow, radiant barriers and reflective insulation work by reflecting radiant heat. Radiant barriers are usually installed in attics, primarily to reduce summer heat gain, which helps lower cooling costs. Reflective insulation incorporates radiant barriers, typically highly reflective aluminum foils, into the insulation systems that can be used and included in a variety of backings, such as craft paper, plastic film, polyethylene bubbles, or cardboard, as well as thermal insulation materials. Concrete is used to build foundations and walls, and on its own, concrete is a terrible insulator. But there are several ways to insulate it. Concrete blocks have cores that are empty spaces. Sometimes these cores are filled with concrete and steel for structural reasons, but if the cores aren't filled, they can be filled with insulation, which raises the average wall R value. Field studies and computer simulations have shown, however, that core filling of any type offers little fuel savings because heat is readily conducted through the solid parts of the walls, such as the block webs and mortar joints. It is more effective to install insulation over the entire surface of the concrete, either on the exterior or interior of the foundation walls. Placing insulation on the exterior has the added advantage of containing the thermal mass of the concrete within the conditioned space, which can moderate indoor temperatures. Some manufacturers incorporate polystyrene beads into concrete blocks, while others make concrete blocks that accommodate rigid foam inserts. Hollow core units made with a mix of concrete and wood chips are also available. They are installed by stacking the units without using mortar, called dry stacking, and filling the cores with concrete and structural steel. Concrete block walls are typically insulated or built with insulating concrete blocks during new construction or major renovations. Block walls in existing buildings can be insulated from the inside. Insulating concrete forms, or ICFs, are basically forms of poured concrete walls which remain part of the wall assembly. This system creates walls with a high thermal resistance, typically about R20. Even though ICF buildings are constructed using concrete, they look more like traditional stick-built construction. ICF systems consist of interconnected foam boards or interlocking hollow core foam insulating blocks. Foam boards are fastened together using plastic ties. Along the foam boards, steel rods or rebar can be added for reinforcement before the concrete is poured. When using foam blocks, steel rods are often used inside the hollow cores to strengthen the walls. Structural insulated panels, or SIPs, are prefabricated insulated structural elements for use in building walls, ceilings, floors, and roofs. When installed properly, SIPs also result in a more airtight dwelling, which makes a building quieter and more comfortable than a conventional building. SIPs are available with different insulating materials, usually polystyrene or polyisocyanurate foam. SIPs not only have high R values, but also have a high strength to weight ratio. A SIP typically consists of a four to eight inch thick foam board insulation sandwiched between two sheets of oriented strand board or other structural facing materials. Manufacturers can usually customize the exterior and interior sheathing materials to meet customer requirements. The facing is glued to the foam core and the panel is then either pressed or placed in a vacuum to bond the sheathing and core together. Just because the insulation has a rated R value doesn't mean you will achieve that R value in practice. 
The quality of insulation is critical to achieve the rated R value, as well as how the insulation interacts with the structure of the building and other pieces such as plumbing and electrical. Manufacturers provide very specific guidance on insulation installation to provide the rated R value. The question really is, how much insulation should a building have and where is it best put? That highly depends on the climate, the type of heating and cooling system, and the function of the building. In reality, the amount of insulation needed for a building depends on its energy goals. As the designer of the building, you have control of these goals and ultimately how the building performs. In other episodes, we will take the R value of the insulation and show the techniques to begin to calculate the amount, depending on your application. In addition, the envelope must provide air sealing and moisture control, and the thermal insulation is an important, important part of this. To conclude this episode, I want to finish by saying that while it's important to understand local building code requirements when choosing insulation for a building. I encourage you to go beyond the minimum requirements and evaluate all of the possible options for insulation materials and applications. By doing this, you're likely to find opportunities to reduce heat transfer through the building envelope and consequently reduce energy consumption in the building. Thanks for watching this episode and please let us know if you have any questions.